Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Zapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is JJ Reader. She's the head director of Remote Organizational Effectiveness at Upwork. And JJ, would you tell folks who don't know about Upwork what it does? I, by the way, use Upwork myself and I know that it's a really great platform, but tell folks who don't know what it does and how could people can use it. So Upwork is the world's work marketplace. So we we connect businesses with independent talent all around the world, meaning that we have a strong interest in the value of remote work. Um, mm -hmm. Upwork's network spans the globe. It is made up with uh, of independent professionals that sell their services, whether it be to individuals, to small businesses, or even to enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are very committed at Upwork to understanding the future of work landscape, what it looks like, how we can leverage it, not just for our team, but yeah. also for other businesses that we consult with and that we work with. So we try to do a lot of lab style experimentation and try to figure out these future of work topics so that we can serve our clients as well as our team. Excellent. And I hired a number of my employees from Upwork for my consulting firm. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Great. Now, what have you found is are some best practices for working effectively in a remote setting? Ah, my favorite topic. <laughs> so um, there are many different ways to think about working effectively in a remote mm -hmm. setting. And I think the first thing that I can probably say is that it's different for every person and every team. Mm -hmm. And I want to resist the the thought that there is a one size fit all, mm. one size fits all solution. Mm. But that said, there are certain things that we are starting to coalesce around as best practices, right? Things like having excellent documentation, like understanding yeah. how to communicate clearly, use low context communication and give people the full information because that then empowers mm. asynchronous collaboration, right? Reduces the meetings on our calendar, gives oh. us the time to focus on our work, gives us flexibility in our days. So it, that it, that's the kind of lens that I usually try to mm. apply to it is not just how do you work well remotely as in how do I sit in my chair and answer emails? Mm -hmm. It's more, how am I setting myself and my teammates up mm -hmm. to have as much flexibility as possible in our days? And so it's a little bit more of thinking through and being considerate of the kind of second order outcomes. Mm -hmm. of that's, I think, a really valuable point. It's kind of talking about the frameworks here. And there are a certain number of frameworks. So I helped 25 clients figure out I now figure out their hybrid and remote work contexts and the cloud and for the remote work component of what I do, it's definitely important to help people get the context because that's something that's missing when you're not in the office. Another thing that you briefly mentioned that I want to go in depth into is the difference in the type of communication that you do. What I find is that when working with clients who can come to the office and who can work remotely, with the most intense forms of collaboration tend to best be done in the office. You do, when you're in person and synchronous communication, that's the most intense form of communication and collaboration because you pick up all the body language, all the nuances, you get excited with each other, you have more alignment. The second most intense form of collaboration and gives you more moderate, I say, ability to collaborate and communicate is virtual, remote, and async and synchronous, so at the same time. And the least form of, the form of communication gives you the least collaboration is, and least nuance, is a form of asynchronous and remote. But the costs go along with it. The highest cost is being in the office. Then the second highest cost is virtual and asynchronous, virtual and synchronous, and the least costly is virtual and asynchronous. I encourage clients to try to figure out how can they push communication down into the lowest buckets uh, while still making sense and being effective. And I'm curious how you solve that problem at Upwork of making sure that communication is least costly, but still highly effective. I love this framework. This is a really good way of thinking about it. And I, I want to also add another element, which is there's cost in, you know, 
facilitation and then there's cost in people's time. Uh -huh. um, and that yep. is absolutely true that like the, the costliest is getting everyone into the office to have a synchronous moment. But in that moment, people are using their full five senses, right? They're yeah. fully there. And then the the least costly is writing it all down in a document somewhere, but that is just the limited form of comprehension. So um, the way we're currently thinking about this at Upwork is we wanna have a balance. Mm -hmm. We, you know, It's important to not just do all one way of communication. There's a lot of reasons. Number one is that we don't all communicate in the same way. People sure. get, the, you know, people's brains light up in different ways for different tasks, different activities, yeah. and people just have different brains that respond to different types of information. And so we want to have a range of ways for people to connect. Uh, and we're trying to really dig into that. How do we provide opportunities for mm -hmm. people to get together in person and also have a strong framework for independent asynchronous collaboration. One of the things about Upwork is that we still have our offices. So even though um, previous to the pandemic, a large portion of our workforce was working remotely, we did have offices in Chicago and San Francisco. And even when we transitioned to being a remote first company, we kept those. And so now we're thinking about what are the offices, right? Like, what is the purpose of that? And the more and more that we think about it, it's that full synchronous collaboration. Yeah. It's an opportunity for teams to all fly to Chicago, fly to San Francisco, yeah. get together, have a week-long offsite bond, go out together, have yeah. those whiteboard brainstorms, and have that full immersive experience, and then go back to the flexible work that we do every day and have stronger relationships to bank on in those moments when we can't be together in an office. I think that's really important to insight and I tell my clients that the on-site is the new off-site. You fly to the, everyone yeah. to the office and you actually meet in the office and maybe go somewhere else, but the on-site is the new off-site. I like that. So great. So that's, we're clearly on the same page. I want to dig a little bit deeper into the virtual and asynchronous. Now, one of the things that my clients don't immediately realize is that when they think virtual and asynchronous, they think text. Well, what I talk to them about is there are divisions, gradations within that. The most complex and most costly form of virtual and asynchronous is communication with video. So it's not simply text, but you will record a video of yourself, communicate it to others, and that has a lot of nuance and context, verbal cues, conveying emotions that are missing when you just do text. I mean, you can use emojis, but it's still hard to convey that nuance. This next level down there in that bucket. So there's kind of three, bu three buckets within that last bucket. The next level down is audio. It's easier to do than video, but it doesn't convey the nonverbal cues. It does convey the tone, which helps convey emotions. And the least costly and the least communicative and effective is the text. And you, the nice thing is with audio and video, now with modern tools, with AI, you can easily get a transcript and have a transcript as well if you want to follow and make sure nobody misses anything that you said. But the video, audio, text is something that my clients find very helpful for communicating to their teams, again, with that for emotions and nonverbal cues, then just emotions without the nonverbal cues, and then neither the emotions nor the nonverbal cues. I'm curious what you found in communicating virtually asynchronously using non-text forms of communication. So um, I have a slightly different view on it from you, but I start mm. from the same place. So I'm gonna, I, I have like a couple of nuanced details that I think yeah. about it slightly differently, but I start from the same place as you, which is yes, the the video, the pre-recorded video gives you the most information. And I especially like the, the model of recording a video and then adding a transcript to yep, the video. Exactly. Yep. And that way yep. everyone can understand, gets the full information. Mm -hmm. That takes the most time to produce. Once again, it's a time investment, right? Yeah, that yeah. Is most layered. costly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the most costly. Uh, and so that absolutely I agree with. For me, audio is actually less communicative. I happen to be hmm. some processes information visually. Um, mm. But I also think that there is a lot of nuance that for people who don't necessarily speak the same language natively can mm. be lost in audio. Mm. 
And so I actually defer to text as the second level. Mm -hmm. I think text provides more context um, mm -hmm. because people are able to think through things more logically. You can mm -hmm. ask questions, you can interact via text, you can't interact with an audio recording. Uh, and so I find text to actually be more communicative mm -hmm. with emojis, <laughs> with emojis and maybe with some images built mm -hmm. in, right? So it is slightly maybe, uh, added like add to the text just a little bit and then I would say audio for me I would call one of the less communicative forms mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's missing the visual component as a visual mm -hmm. learner I tend to disconnect when I'm only hearing audio that's my personal bias right I'm aware of that personal bias but I think it's valid when we have these conversations it's not it's not a clear spectrum right there's not a point a and point b I think that having lighting up as many senses as we can in mm -hmm. the information processing is the most useful way to do it. Mm -hmm. But once we're only lighting up one or two senses, then it, mm -hmm. it's less important which ones they are. Interesting. Okay. I do find, I mean, for video and audio, you, can, oh, you should always get the transcript, so you still get the text from it. And there are some people who are auditory learners for whom the audio is helpful. But yes, I find that I more rarely do audio. I do video or text and then audio kind of more rarely. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Now, I want to uh, turn to another topic of, of from communication to collaboration. There are a number of techniques for having effective collaboration when people work remotely. And I'm curious what you found to be effective to facilitate that form, those forms of collaboration. It's a really thorny issue. This is the big mm. challenge, right? Is I think this is where the most work is currently being done. Mm. And I think the answers are the least clear mm. um, because collaboration is never easy. <laughs> even if we're collaborating in person. Um, and so turning it into something that can be done remotely is difficult mm -hmm. because then we have to turn it truly into a process and a system mm -hmm. where when you're in person and you're collaborating and something doesn't go quite right, you can adjust in the moment. But because so much of remote collaboration has to happen asynchronously or across, you know, text communication lines, um, then it quickly breaks down. And so we have to rely on a really strong process and a system for that. So I think the best ways for that I always advise people to do it is to really rely on strong documentation um, and to mm -hmm. really understand before you enter into a collaboration, have I provided the people that I'm collaborating with, with the full information, the context on why we're doing what we're doing, expectations, timelines, resources that they may need to fall, to fall on, and then any systems that we're going to use to collaborate with one another. Do they have access to those systems? That's mm -hmm. a lot to think about before you start a collaboration. And most of us are not used to doing that, right? Um, and then in the moment, in the process of the collaboration, you have to be very consistent mm -hmm. about checking in uh, in these very sort of subtle ways, right? Like you have to make sure that the vibes stay good <laughs> <laughs> and that, that we're, you know, we're still getting along and that, you know, if someone isn't saying something that you're able to maybe draw that out of them, if they're, mm -hmm. you know, they have some kind of feedback that they're not necessarily sharing, how are you going to surface that? How are you going to create opportunities for people to give feedback so that you don't end up with a collaboration that you think has gone well and then it turns yeah. out that the result is no good. So there's a lot more science that goes into it and a lot more planning than we're typically used to. I like the use of um, project management tools. I yes. think that's key. Uh, I like definitely the, I like a mix of evergreen documentation, something like a project document mm -hmm. brief with chat and definitely really making use of the chat and the day-to-day, -day, mm -hmm. almost let's like quasi-synchronous communication mm -hmm. uh, that you can use to contact each other quickly and understanding how to use that balance in order to get as much communication flowing as possible. That's Oh, that's really helpful. I think that's a very rich answer. The one thing I, uh, besides what you talked about, one thing I found helpful for my clients is to do a form of virtual co-working where you not simply communicate by chat, but you also get in a video conference call with each other. And that's not meant to do a collaborative activity. That's meant to work on your individual tasks. So you're working on your individual tasks. Let's say you get together with one-on-one -on -one or with a team of your team of six to eight people 
and you work on your individual tasks. That's the goal of that time for about an hour. But if people have questions or comments or ideas that they want to solve, problem solve or brainstorm, then they can, you turn off, you, so at the beginning, you turn off your microphone, you turn on your speakers, leave them on, your camera is optional. But if you have a question or comment, you turn on your microphone and you ask that question or you make the comment or you ask for solutions to a problem. And that is a really useful activity, I find, and other people will answer. And then you have a brief discussion and you go on. So this is a really useful activity where teams tend to leave tasks that are team members leave tasks that are more challenging or the ones they have more questions on for this period of the day. That's a good thing to do once a day for teams. And so this form of virtual co-working I find is quite useful to solve that immediate ability to answer questions, which might be a complex task that you don't have expertise, especially useful for junior staff, getting them on the job training. But I'm curious about your thoughts on virtual co-working. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Um, I think you're absolutely right on about that. I've seen it done well. Um, I don't typically see it done daily. And so I think that's an interesting application for it, especially with junior teams. It can yes. be very useful, right, for people who are learning the day to day of their job to have mm -hmm. that sort of free space where it's easy to ask a question. It's almost as if you were in an office together. I think it'd be super exactly. helpful. So it depends on the seniority level of your team. It depends on the complexity of the work. But I think it's a really good model, and I've, I see a lot of people using it. And I'll add another one as well, which yeah. is that, um, the guided brainstorm at the start of a project. We've been trying to figure out how do you really effectively do a brainstorm remotely? And the answer yeah. is the best kind of brainstorm is still when we all get together in an office. I won't deny yeah. that. But there are a lot of things you can do using sort of visual collaboration tools like Miro, right? Mm -hmm. We can get together and we can do a, a whiteboard flow. And so we did one recently with my team where we all got sticky notes and we moved them across through various phases of decision making to the end when we had chosen the sticky notes that we were going to work on. And being in that moment together and being that, in that process together live on a call gave us that ability to sort of debate the finer points, to suss out the issues and to engage with it actively. And I think there's a lot to that. Excellent. Well, uh, so there's a really useful technique that I developed called virtual asynchronous brainstorming, which is specifically developed for a virtual format. So what that involves is first, there's an asynchronous component. I think a lot of the virtual brainstorming, well, when you say you know, the best brainstorming is in the office, it's because it's more hard, difficult to do brainstorming when you're remote. Yeah. Uh, you kind of trip on each other, you, know, you can't see each other's cues. So the key, and uh, I have a Harvard Business Review article on this, I'll send it to you later and I will we'll also link it in the show notes. So what this involves, so the first step is that everyone asynchronously, separately from each other, generates ideas and puts them into a Google form or mural for something visual or Microsoft forms. So it gets all of your ideas out. So everyone individually. Then you clean that up, whoever's the facilitator, and you get the spreadsheets with these ideas. So let's say you have five people, you have 10, 12 ideas per person, and the two of them are duplicative per person, so you have 10 ideas left. Then you get the spreadsheet to the rest of everyone, and you rate them on categories like novelty, practicality, impact, excitement from zero to five. And so now you have each person rating each idea in four categories on a zero to five. So each idea now has anywhere from zero to 20. And you add them up, so five people. So now each idea has zero to 100. Then you just, and they can also leave comments. And then for the final session, which is virtual synchronous, you simply choose the best ideas. You have a cutoff point. Let's say you have 90 ideas that got 90 or above, or 80 and above. And you just focus on those ideas. And that's a much, much easier time because the challenge with brainstorming when you're working virtually is the divergence part. The convergence part is much easier. And especially when you have already evaluated the ideas, you know which ones are the best ones. You're just focusing on, okay, which of these are we going to choose and which of these are we going to implement? I read this article. Thank you. Oh, for that was a, it would definitely helped me with my planning Oops. process for the brainstorm. And I think the key is truly understanding the asynchronous preparation. So thank you for <laughs> <Yeah>. writing it. 
Everybody well, can watch, please read this. This is a, you know, it's it's really important to understand what this virtual brainstorming process can look like if we don't have the office available to us. And I love that model. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear that that's been helpful. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is something that you briefly mentioned, the helping people who are junior. What tactics have you found to help junior people be onboarded into the team? This is another area where I think a lot will be done in the years to come. I think one thing that the data is really showing us right now is that yes, a lot of people, most of us really enjoy working remotely, but new career professionals and people who are more junior in their roles need more day-to-day -day guidance. It's really difficult to be junior in your role and working remotely, not sure how to connect with people. So I think that there needs to be a much more intentional approach. Things that we do, um, you know, to bring people on board, things like onboarding buddies and regular team calls need to be amped up just another level. And I think that I don't have the best answers for this. Mm. And I, I believe that those answers are still being developed because it's relatively new, right? This is sort yeah, of a new of finding and it's something that we we sort of could have assumed, but we, we missed it a little bit, I think, that of course, new career professionals need more connection. They, they also want to build their networks. They need more access, right? They need mm -hmm. access to executives and thought leaders and people who they can look up to and network with and start to build their own career yeah. path. So the answers, I don't think, are, are totally clear. I think those are the questions that we should be asking. And if you're running a team and you're hiring junior folks, then those are the questions you should be asking is how am I providing opportunities for people to connect, a mm -hmm. clarity on their career path, understanding of how they're going to move forward in their career, mm -hmm. opportunities for them to just meet and get to know their coworkers. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answers are, but if you know them, I'd love to hear what you're doing. <laughs> sure. So I think definitely having someone, a buddy on your team is very helpful, but the problem with just having a buddy on your team is it doesn't really help connections across the organization. It doesn't yeah. help you network. So there are two other things that my clients have found super helpful. One is to form a peer cohort of yeah. junior people. So a cohort based mentoring where you have a senior person who mentors a cohort of several junior people. Those junior people can be across, should be across departments. And so, but they all have the experience of being junior recently hired. And so they can help each other in a lot of ways. Peer to peer learning has been shown to be incredibly effective for people to actually learn, develop. And then they develop those networks and they share in each other's networks. So again, they're from different departments, they can introduce each other to each other. That has been a very effective strategy. So peer cohort mentoring is a really useful tactic. I love it. We've been experimenting a lot with cohorts sort of throughout the organization. We're doing mm -hmm. things like also cohorts for people who are new in a people leader, like management role, right? How mm -hmm. do we connect new managers with each other so they can do that same kind yeah. of peer to peer problem solving and learning? And then definitely we have onboarding cohorts. Um, I think it's I think it's really wise to think about implementing those for junior team members as well. So, well, good. I'm glad that's helpful. And as we finish up, what is your vision of the future of remote work at Upwork? Ah, <laughs> so I think my vision of the future of remote work at Upwork is actually very similar to uh, what we're trying to implement right mm -hmm. now. I think that the future for this particular organization, and again, I want to underline that not every organization will have the same answer, but for this particular organization, I think the future looks like continuing to have this vibrant global distributed team that works together. Every single team is a mix of people from all over the world in different time zones and different responsibilities who come together intentionally, whether it's virtually or in person, at least in person as much as possible to have those moments of connection and then continue to work remotely flexibly on their own terms, on their own schedules. Um, I think it's a good model. I think it's a model that has legs and has longevity and I don't think it needs too many tweaks. I think we just need to figure out how to execute it extremely well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, JJ. Your expertise has been very helpful. Wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and make sure to leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. 
I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.